we give all the glory and honor to God. That's a beautiful and wonderful song that we have just enjoyed together as we worshiped. It says, you are my brother, you are my sister. It doesn't matter what denomination you come from, which church you go to, which background you are from, as long as you believe in our Lord Jesus Christ and you have embraced his gift of eternal life, you are my brother, my sister. I pray that in this season, as we are in the lockdown, we shall realize there is no difference. We are the same. We are in the family of God, and we call upon God through one name, the name of the loving Jesus. And let that be pulling us together, uniting us together, and causing us to hear the heart of God together. We love you, and we treasure you. We treasure your fellowship. I thank God for this evening. Thank God for the wonderful time of prayer. We are going to be doing more and more practical things. It's not just coming to teach and preach or share the word. We want to even begin to do those practical things like engaging together in prayer or in some time of worship so that we are, we are talking of something that is tangible and we want it to produce life. Hallelujah. Now, my sharing this evening is going to be very short. Uh, I, again, I want to encourage you more and more that we spend more time in practicing what we are learning rather than in heaping more and more knowledge. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Oh God, creator of the universe, you alone deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. You are the majesty that we worship. We thank you that at a time like this, we have men and women and children all across the nations locked up in their homes, unable to go to all the busy schedules and programs that formerly would take away our attention. And now we can focus on you and we can focus on each other, loving each other, becoming one in Christ. So even in this atmosphere, my Lord, come, Lord, come and teach us come and groom us in your ways come and promote us to that deeper level of knowledge the knowledge of your companionship i thank you and i bless you as i surrender everything into your hands and i i say lord bind us together join our spirits together across the thousands of miles that we may all bring one chorus of worship and prayer before you lord we ask this in jesus name Amen, amen. Yes, we are going to take just one step forward in learning how to walk this path of the prayer altar in the family. There are so many types of prayer altars. There is what we call a personal prayer altar, which is supposed to be something between you alone and God. And that is supposed to be how do you turn your heart into an altar of prayer? And how do you ensure that the fire of God will rest upon your heart continually? We shall take time to study that. But in this particular season, I sense that the Holy Spirit is very, very concerned about the family altar. And having brought us together in the, in the setting of a family, most families are now locked down in their homes and, uh, in their homes and houses across the world, not just here in Uganda, all across Africa and many other parts of the world. So it's a wonderful privilege for us to be able to join our hearts together around a subject so dear to the heart of God, the family altar. And together we can begin to set this fire ablaze. Oh, glorious Lord, we give you praise. Now, let me ask you to go with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 26. Uh, we are going to read about Abraham and Isaac when God spoke to Abraham and told him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to him. Amen. <clears throat> So let us go to Isaiah 24, no, Genesis 24. 
excuse me, give me just a moment to locate the right passage so that we can together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Savior. So it's in Isaiah, in Genesis chapter 22, and I'm going to read from verse 5. Thank you, Lord. Now, just before that, you'll go back and read for yourself. It starts from verse 1, when God spoke to Abraham, and he said, now, verse 2, he says, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This is what the Lord asked Abraham to do. This is one of the hardest thing for any person to do, to take that which is the most precious to you, and you go and you offer it to God. I want you to think about what Isaac was to, Je to Abraham. He was the son of the promise. But besides that, he was the only son Abraham had ever had on earth. And Abraham was almost a hundred years old now. So, uh, okay, he had had uh, Ishmael. Uh, but in his wife, Sarai, that was the only son they had. So when God told him, it was a, an act of faith that Abraham took this journey. And he did not tell the boy what they were going to do, what, that he was going to offer him. He just told him, let us go to the mountains and give an offering uh, unto the Lord. Now, what, what I want to bring out today is different. It's not so much on that sacrifice, but it's on the knowledge of the altar. So, let us read from verse 6. It says, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and Abraham said, Here I am, my son. Then Isaac said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. This is where I want us to focus today. Abraham is taking his son. He doesn't want to do what he's going to do, but he's obeying the Lord. And Abraham and God had told him to go and offer his own son as a sacrifice. And as they go up, the son says, Daddy, I can see the fire and I can see the firewood. But where is the lamb of the offering? Now, brother, sister, the point I want to, point, to bring out here is, do you realize that Isaac was not a stranger to the altar. He had been there before with his father. He even knew what was required at the altar. If it had been his first time, he would simply have followed his father, looking at the fire and the firewood and not seeing an animal but thinking nothing about it. He would just go, go along, go along and wait until that moment when the father is looking for the real sacrifice. But this time, the boy who has been with his father to the altar many, many, many times, he senses that something is not right, something is missing. We normally come with firewood, with fire, and with an animal. So he says, Papa, where is the animal that we are supposed to offer? Of course, you understand the dilemma in which Abraham was. He had no animal, and he could not tell him, you are the sacrifice. And for me, that's not where I want to go. I want to stay with Isaac. I want to stay with the fact that Abraham had been to the altar before with his son Isaac. And Abraham had not only been there once, he had been there so many times that now the boy even knew what was required if you're going to the altar. I want to say this to parents. I want to say this to fathers and mothers. 
This is the first lesson we are learning today. I grew up in a family. In my own family, we were very devout as Catholics. We would pray the, no, the rosary together. We would pray the novena. But it was like, when it comes to bedtime prayers, we, the children, would go in our bedroom and we would pray our bedtime prayers together. One of us would lead and we would all pray according to the prayer book. But my dad and my mom would go to their bedroom and they would pray alone. And uh, we never thought about it. Actually, when it came to the novenas, also we normally prayed alone as children. And when I was at school, of course, we would pray as students. The rosary. The rosary had, uh, I think we had a season where we would pray at the rosary every day. Then the mommy would come and join us. Or we would go in the compound, we sit together, and we would pray the rosary together. And mommy would be with us. But never was daddy ever with us. Never. I never prayed prayers with my dad when I was young. I prayed with him when he was grown up and he had given his life to the Lord Jesus. But this is a very common practice with many parents. We sort of think, oh, let the children pray alone. Let the children pray alone. And we will also pray. Sometimes when the kids are small, we use the excuse. They cannot bear the long prayers we are going to pray. So let us say a simple prayer of one minute over them. Then we shall go and pray our longer prayers. Or just, we are going to, talk, to pray about serious things we don't want them to get involved in. So you take them to bed, you even cover them in the bed, and when they are already in the bed with their heads covered, then you pray. You say a prayer, and all they have to say is, Amen. Beloved, those are all very good, convenient, modern things. They are not the way of the Lord. Go back in the scriptures and look at the scriptures. The way of the Lord is engagement. Teach your child to engage with God with you. I want to show you another man of God who was also very godly, but we don't see any record in his life of him engaging his children in the business of seeking the Lord. His name was called Lot. Lot was in the family of Abraham. Actually, they moved together for many years. They were together and, uh, and uh, they were in the same family. They were moving together. But Lot, there came a time when there was uh, conflict and strife between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. And Abraham said to Lot, look, there's no need for us to quarrel and fight. Choose if you go to the east, I'll go to the west. If you go to the west, I'll go to the east. And the Bible says, Lot picked to go to the east. And he went to a valley of the land which was very, very fertile, very prosperous. And that valley had two big cities in it. One city was called Sodom and the other city was called Gomorrah. Very prosperous cities. Now, when you read the scriptures, because it's, it's a long passage, I'll ask you, you can go and read. Uh, when you read the scriptures, when Lot went to Sodom, the first thing he did was, let us read uh, Genesis chapter 13. I want you to see that. The first thing he did when he went to Sodom, he settled outside the city, outside the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now let's see, verse 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, okay, L verse 10, Lord lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zohar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Now listen. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful, against the Lord. Do you hear that? Now, Lot has settled in an environment 
where the people around are exceedingly wicked and sinful to the Lord. Now, that's a different environment from where Abraham is. Abraham is out there in the plains, in the mountains, and uh, he's with the sheep. So the atmosphere there is not so congested, and it's not as wicked and evil as the one where Lot has gone. Just as I can say, the atmosphere in cities and metropolitans is thicker spiritually than the atmosphere in the countryside. Now, that's reality. Just as you see that populations in the city are thicker, dense, and more congested together, and when you go to the countryside, the populations are more spread out, even so in the spirit. The spiritual atmosphere in a city is much more congested. There are a lot of spirits, a lot of spiritual beings, a lot of satanic agents, and a lot of other players. So in a simple way, I can say it's harder to prevail in a city than it is to prevail in the village. It's just a reality. It's just a reality. Okay, now, does that mean that uh, we should run and stay in the villages? No. It means we should grow stronger. And the people who know their God shall be strong. So it's up to you to get to know God deeper so he may make you stronger and you can prevail in the city. No problem. The problem comes when you settle in a, a, a place, an atmosphere of dense populated, densely populated spiritual environment and you don't know what to do. And you don't know how to prevail. Now when you follow the story of Lot, and I will ask you to go read the book of Genesis. We are men and women of the word, so praise the Lord. When you go and read the story, you'll find that in the beginning, Lot was outside the city of Sodom. Then later on, he was inside the city of Sodom. He was part now of the citizens of the city of Sodom. Later on, we see he had gained a position at the gate of Sodom. Now, in the old days, the people who sat at the gate were the city elders, the city governor, the city prophet, the city clerk. They, the gate was the most influential part of the city. That's why even today we talk of spiritual gates. And you may find a place in the city center is not at the boundary, but we know it's a city gate. Things which are released there spread all over the country. Things which are bound there are bound in all the country. And we shall come back one day and talk about city gates and uh, points of authority. But now I want to keep with, uh, one, uh, with a simple lesson I want to bring to us, especially to parents. So Lot is now inside. And he's not only inside the atmosphere of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's now got into the leadership echelons of Sodom. That means he's in the corridors of power is in the chambers of, of secrecy, is in the confidentiality of the powerful. The powerful, the wealthy, the influential, I, I can now hold him into confidence. When you gain that kind of position in society, my brother, my sister, you are in an even deeper spiritual environment than a normal person in the city. I can say this to our, my friends in the politics, in government, in uh, all those areas of deeper influence. Every time you go into deeper influence of human affairs, you are going into more dense population of spiritual beings and activities. I'm not saying this to intimidate you, and I'm not saying this to put you off. I'm saying the more, the deeper you are, the higher, you, the deeper you need to go with God. Those men of you, the men and women who are deep in those areas and you don't know God, you are open sitting ducks. The enemy, he can get you anytime. He can get your family. He can get your loved ones. He can get anything of yours. Or he can drag you into unholy covenants. And that happens so many times to those who go deeper in wealth, deeper in politics, deeper in influence, deeper in celebrity life and all that kind of life. Oh, I tell you, my brother, even celebrity life, wonderful and glamorous as it looks, the deeper you go, the more influence you have on people. The more influence you have on people, the more secrets you touch and the more influencers you touch and the more covenants you are asked to enter. Oh, come on. Go check it out. 
Check it out. You're going to find it. Now, now we are beginning to touch the society. Prayer is not just, oh Lord, give me this, give me that. Prayer is about ruling with God in society. And now I'm, t- I'm beginning to give you the gems. You, you are a man of God and a woman of God who is supposed to be ruling with Christ in this generation. So you need to understand these dynamics because your prayer is going to begin moving this society. Your prayer is going to begin moving this economy. Your prayer is going to begin moving the education center, the education sector, the health, and all of that. So I want to encourage you, open your heart, lift your voice, and lift your faith, because you are now becoming a bigger player in the affairs of your nation. Amen. So Lot is in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's now in those influential positions, and the the city is bubbling with sin. The city is bubbling with wickedness. The city is bubbling with awkward types of abominations. The Bible says the men and, and the men of that city, all of them practiced sodomy. <laughs> all of them practiced homosexuality. All of them were evil at heart. All of them, the whole city was so thick. Now, before I go to Sodom and you may be wondering, oh my God, what did Lot want with Sodom? I want to say to you, anyone, you and me who dwell in the city, that is the environment we are dealing with. Cities are like that. Cities, these gatari kung fu, you see all these things that are scandalous. We are living in that environment. We have sorcerers, we have murderers, we have cheats, we have con men, we have uh, harlots and we prostitutes, we have... Uh, people, all kinds of people all around us, your neighbors, your next other neighbor, you don't know who they are and you don't know what they do in the secret. You don't know what they do in their secret covens. You don't know what they do in their businesses. You don't know what they do in their secret worship when they go in the night and do all kinds of things. That is the reality. Some people think I can survive without prayer. Not until you know what is around you. Not when you know who is, what's around you and what's, uh, and what's going on. When, when you realize what's around you and how wicked people can be, you can't do without prayer. You can't ignore a prayer. Now listen. Lord had two daughters. These daughters were humble and holy and pure. They were in the family of their parents. I want to believe the testimony of Lot, that these girls were not infidel, they didn't, didn't practice infidel, infidelity. They were not promiscuous. They were not going out there exposing their bodies to the men. They were, they were chaste. They were careful with their lives. They were humble girls. And their father could testify for them and say, I have got two girls of marriage age, but they have never seen any man. Now, today, those of us who are parents, you know how difficult it is for a parent to make that statement. That they have children of marriage age who have never entangled with another man, with a man. Or boys of marriage age who have never entangled with girls. I leave that to us. and you, As parents, we know what we grapple with. Now, this is the world we are living in. I'm trying to impress upon you the altar in the family is not a, a, a privilege. It's not, it's not a luxury. It's necessary. It's important. So Lot at least is happy when he's moving out and is going to the gate to make laws for the city dwellers. He, he has got his good children at home. He can make these tough laws for these uh, rowdy children of the city. They, like our members of parliament, can go to parliament and make laws for us. For them, they are well, maybe they are well protected, maybe. And some of us, we go and do these businesses which are dangerous to society. You bring fake goods, counterfeit, you bring bicupoli, and you, you feed society because you, you are sure your, your home is protected. Your home is fine. This is the naivety that is in the society. You find someone stealing money for building a hospital because he has got the capacity to fly to Europe. Until one day, when your sickness comes so fast, you cannot fly. He can't allow you even on the plane. Then you've got to go to that clinic whose money you stole. 
These, these are realities. So Lot is, is there. He's prevailing in the city. He doesn't even care about the sinfulness and wickedness of the city. It doesn't touch him. For him, he has got his two children who are real. They are real. Then one day, be without Lot knowing, God talks to Abraham and says, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is too much. It has reached up to heaven. It is screaming in my presence. I can't bear it. I've come down to see if it is really like that. If so, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot doesn't know. Lot is in the city, but God does not talk to Lot. Why? Lot has not created that environment. So God talks to Abraham, who normally has that environment of drawing God's presence. God can easily visit his home. It is not an abomination for God to visit Abraham. Even when the angels came, Abraham did not say, who is that? He recognized, oh my God, this is God. And he went to, he, it was not a strange thing for him. This is what I'm telling you, brother, sister, my friend, my sister, my grand, grandmother, grandfather. Let us make God not a visitor at home, but a member of the home. Let his presence abide with us. Then he will tell us secrets, not only concerning our lives, but concerning the city and concerning the nation. He will tell us things which are yet to come. He, God wanted to talk, but he could not talk to a lot. I mean, Lot was living a religious life, very holy, but we don't see an altar of prayer in his life or in his home. There's no way it is mentioned. And I know when God wants us to know something, he'll make sure it is mentioned somebody, somewhere. So God goes to Abraham, talks to him about Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is given an opportunity to intercede. He makes intercessions. He makes supplications. Oh my God, what if they are not 50? Those privileges are given to those people who have allowed those environments to come about. If you have not created an environment, God will never even give you an opportunity to say, can you plead for somebody? And I'm going to show you, Lot was given a chance like that, which he was not used to, and he blew it. He blew it. Now, we see later that... Uh, God comes into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, Lot is there. But God comes, first of all, as angels. The two angels who were with him, they come into the city and they walk through the city. They, they do a survey, a survey of the city. And afterwards, they visited, they visited Lot. And Lord welcomed them. They looked like simple human beings. Lord welcomed them into his house and entertained them. In his spirit, he could tell these men are not just simple, mere men. They are, they are uh, angels of the Lord. Now, the family sat together, ate together with the angels, and soon it was time to go to bed. What Lord did not know or realize is that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had also noticed the visitors. The two wonderful visitors, like they're out of this world, beautiful, handsome, attractive. And the news had gone around. And the passion, the sexual passion of the city had been released and it started burning. The Bible tells me that all, all the men and the women all the men and the women of Sodom and Gomorrah gathered together, young and old. This is amazing. This is not like in the normal ways where we know when people get uh, attracted, they go secretly, they try to go to get that person who has attracted them. They may send somebody, but they do it secretly. This time the men and the women of Sodom and Gomorrah, all of them joined together and they wanted to go for the angels. Two angels with versus all the population of the men and we and, and boys of Sodom and Gomorrah. I wonder what they had in their minds. I wonder what they were planning to do and how to do it. And they came to the house of Lot, knocking and saying, Open, open and give us those two visitors who came to see you today. We want to have sex with them. They were very open. They were not even hiding. They said, we want to have sex with them. And Lot came out. And said, please, please don't do this. Don't do this evil thing. He called it wicked thing. Don't do this wicked thing. 
But they said, come on, get out. You were a visitor yesterday. You just came here among us just now. You are telling us what to do. Get out of the way. And they wanted to force, force him out and take the angels by force. But the angels who were inside were monitoring everything that was happening. And they, they, caused, they opened the door. They caused Lot to come in and they closed the door. But they did not stop there. Using their supernatural power, they cast a spell upon the people and all the men went blind. They were there around the house, but they were looking for the door. They couldn't see it. They were touch touching, but they couldn't get it. They were incapacitated. And this one I want to say to the people who know their God. Our God is able. Our God is able to protect us in the most, in the most terrifying circumstances he's able so do not fear these are the things which make a powerful prayer life it's not that just about saying words to God there's a lot that is done inside in our minds and in our hearts and now what we are doing we are slowly beginning to build that kind of attitude that builds prayer the attitude that attracts God you have to gain that confidence in the Lord that my God is able and he will come through for me. So that when you stand, you stand in faith. When we were talking about faith, we said without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And whoever comes to God must believe that God exists and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. So these are the attitudes. Prayer, beloved, and having a prayer altar is a, is a very, very delicate thing. It's not just talking and speaking in the air. It's about inner things coming together, the synergies coming together until we are able to release a powerful blast into the heavens that connects with the throne of God. Hallelujah. So... Uh, these men pull Lot back and let us go and read from the Genesis chapter 19. Genesis uh, chapter 19. Chapter 19 verse 4. Now, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them carnally. That is the same meaning as that we may have sex with them. So Lot went out to them through the door and shut the door behind him. And he said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. Now, in, I know this in the modern times, that is no longer called wickedness. It is called alternative lifestyle. But in those days of the Bible, in the olden days, as well as those days of the scriptures today, that thing is called wickedness. And Lord said to the people, please do not do wickedly. See, now, here is where he's going to make a mess. He says, See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men. Since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. He was willing to offer his children. My brother, daddy, mommy, what is the price you are willing to pay? When will you get to that place where you even close your eyes and offer your children and offer your son and offer your daughter like Lot did? Every man has got a breaking point. You don't want to come to that point. You don't want your children to look you in the eye when you are offering them, surrendering them, giving them up. But Lot did it. Not because he was not a godly man. He was a godly man. But even godly men have a limit until you tap into the infinite power of the Holy Spirit. The infinite power.
power of God. When you have the infinite power, you reach your breaking point and you let it go to God. Like Abraham, he came to his breaking point. He could have fought to retain and keep Isaac, but he put him on the altar and the Lord took him and gave him, gave him back to Abraham. Now that took Abraham from the realm of the natural to the realm of the supernatural. You and I can move there. If we learn, you know that you have your limitations, you know that there's a point where you break, you will surrender, you will compromise, you will sell your soul, you will sell your family, you sell your children, you sell everything. At that point, let God be your strength. Let God be the pillar in your life. And when you reach that point, turn to the Lord and surrender everything. God will take it up and take you to, to a completely new level in Jesus. Oh, let us move forward. He wanted to offer his daughters. I want you to imagine if it had happened. Those daughters, he would have gone back in, grabbed them. I want you to imagine looking them in the eye and they are looking in the, the, his eyes, Daddy, Daddy, no, Daddy. And he would drag them out, out into the streets and he would look them in the eye as he's closing the door. I want you to imagine which parent would want to go through that. And the girls would be taken and be devoured, devoured by the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, old and young. Do you think they would survive the night? And how would Lot live the rest of his life? And how would he and his wife look at each other the rest of their lives? Brother, sister, we have so many challenges in this life. Some challenges we have no answers. You don't want to be put in a position where you have to make a choice. You sell something, you give up something, you compromise something, and you live with the guilt the rest of your life forever and ever and ever. Where am I bringing you all this? Because I want to make our point for tonight. Import, the importance of drawing your children together with you to the altar of the Lord. We'd see Lot was a holy man. If you go and read in the book of Hebrews, the Bible talks about him that he was a, a holy man who grieved and cried daily because of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was sincere. He was an upright man. We are not judging him. But there is one thing we don't see him doing. We don't see him coming with his children to the altar before the Lord. There's no record of that. And when trials came, he failed. The first failure was he wanted to offer them. The angels saved him from that. Now listen. Listen to the second failure. The angels then said, stand back. Then they said, this, uh, the people were saying, stand back. This one came in and to, to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worsely with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lord and came near to break down the door. But the men who were inside, the, the angels, they reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them. And they shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became wary trying to find the door. Then listen to this, verse 12, Genesis 19, 12. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Oh my God, they have come for judgment. They have come to destroy the city. But they are giving Lot an opportunity. They are saying, do you have anybody you care for here? Do you have anybody in this city that you care for? Either a daughter or a son or a son-in-law or whoever. Anybody you care about. Now listen what happened. Verse 14. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. That's what happens when people are far away from God. Even if you prophesy to them, even if you give them a direct word from God, it sounds like a joke. They say, ah, come on, don't waste our time. This is the price we pay 
for not making God the center of our families, for not drawing God close to us. It seems like normal life. It seems like, oh, it's okay until calamity strikes, until a scourge comes, until danger comes, maybe even pestilence like this comes, and then you realize you speak to people and you don't connect. Even if you bring the word of God, they don't honor it. They don't hear you. Beloved, we are talking about the deep, intimate affairs of nations. The people who will change nations, the people who will impact nations, they need to build a foundation. Abraham had a foundation which Lot did not have. Lot had wealth, had power, had influence, politics. He had a position. All those things mean nothing when calamity comes. He had no power to influence even his own sons-in-law. He had no power. And because of that, the angels eventually ended up just lifting him and his wife and his two daughters. Nobody else. He couldn't even save an extra soul. He couldn't help one person escape. Brother, sister, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a leader of some sort, let your life weigh more than that. Let your life weigh more. That if God chooses to save you, you have you have a trail behind you. There are people that are caught up in your trail. They will be lifted up with you to the place of safety. Because you have been nurturing them. You have been touching their lives. You have been influencing them. You are not just as a lone traveler. A lone wolf going without influence through the world. And the influence we are talking about is eternal influence. That when it comes to God rescuing you, he cannot leave your disciples. He cannot leave your followers. He cannot leave your mentees. He cannot leave the people you have touched. He, can, he will give you the opportunity he gave Lord. Do you have anybody here you care about? I will take them with you. In a way, he took them. Now, you know, long story short, these girls who, who were perfect whom Lot did not care about when he was making all these decisions for Sodom and Gomorrah. He could make bad laws for Sodom and Gomorrah as long as his daughters were okay. What he did not know is the environment, the environment in which they lived, the environment of Sodom and Gomorrah had penetrated the heart. The person can be very well mannered, very well behaved, nice daddy's girl, dad, mommy's boy, but when the pressures come, the real character comes out. They were nice, beautiful, wonderful girls as long as they were in the safety of their home. When they went into the mountains with their dad, mommy is lost. She has become a pillar of salt. No man. Suddenly, their true colors came out. Deep inside, they had their imaginations. They were, they were picturing when that time comes, when they would be with this man or with that man and enjoy the life of man and wife and have babies and all of that. Suddenly they realize there are no men here. Only our dad. But so desperate were they and so corrupted inside were they. They conspired to make their daddy drunk. Let's make him take wine and until he's so drunk, then we can sleep with him. No, no holy heart thinks like that. No person with purity of God and fear of God can think of such a thing. I'm going to make my daddy drunk that I can sleep with him. And not only sleep with him, but have a baby with him. And that's what they did. Both of them had babies with their father. Babies, whole tribes, nations came out of that, that bad mistake. I'm, I've gone, I've detoured to, into Lot's life to show you it doesn't matter how rich you are, how well off you are, how peaceful your home is, if God is not there and there's no altar, the end result can be anything. And it doesn't matter how pure and religious your children look like, if they don't have an encounter with God, one day the pressure is going to expose what is inside. I pray that we never let this happen before we do something about it. So what is the difference between the family of Lot and the family of Abraham? One thing we see, young Isaac knows the altar. 
He has been there with his father before. He knows the items of the altar. He knows what to bring at the altar. He says, Daddy, we are going to the altar to give offering, but where? There's the fire. There's the firewood. Where is the animal? I love that. And today I want to say to you, I want to leave you with a meditation. The altar is not just, oh, come let us pray. Come let us pray. No, the altar has got items that need to be present. If they are absent, you, you can gather and pray. It will not make any difference. Just as they had firewood, they had fire, they had an animal, they had the priest who was going to offer. All those are key things. Even the altar of the Lord and the family altar has got elements that need to be present. A person who doesn't know the altar will come and simply sit and wait for the song or for the prayer to start. But a child of the home where there has been an altar of prayer says, Oh, mommy, where is your Bible? Let me bring your Bible. She knows the word of God is part of the elements that must be at the altar. Hallelujah. So tomorrow we are going to share with you the elements. We normally call them the seven essentials. The seven essential things that must be present at the altar. And after we talk about the seven essential things, then we are going to talk about those who practice them and those who do not practice them. And the result that comes in their lives. There are many people with altars. There are so many prayers. People you see here. Oh, together kuchoto. We are going to this altar. We are going to that altar. But the altars are not according to the pattern of the Lord. Do you think every altar that people raise is an altar acceptable to God? I'll give you an example. When God called Gideon, Gideon raised an altar to God. And God kept quiet. Gideon worshipped at the altar. The next day, God comes down and says, Gideon, now do this for me. Go and break the altar, that evil altar of Baal, which your father put up. First destroy it. Remove it. Then go and build me a proper altar. Gideon had already built an altar to God. God did not take it. He said, go build me a proper altar. So my friends out there in your homes, when we talk about prayer altar, we are not just talking about a prayer time. Oh, let us give us a song and we pray that's an altar. No, an altar is supposed to be a very special environment that attracts the praises, the presence of God. And we are going to share everything with you. Step by step we shall go. My only request to you is please practice everything you learn. Don't heap them up hoping that after the lockdown then you'll start. Uh -uh. Let us start now. You get one thing today, practice it. Get another thing today, Practice it. Now, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to say to you, wherever you are, with your children, whether they are small kids, whether they are teenagers or they are adults, let us now come and make a commitment to God. We will appear together before the Lord. I want us to be like Joshua. Joshua warned the children of Israel. He says, this is what will happen to you. This is what will happen to you. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord Almighty. I want to challenge you, my brother, my sister. I want to challenge you, man of God, that make this commitment today. Let us learn the next thing tomorrow when you have already crossed this, this line. Let us not come back tomorrow when you are still pondering whether you are really wa wanting to commit to this thing. Let us make it today. What does that commitment mean? It means today, you purpose to bring your family together before the Lord periodically. If you are not going to do it every day, that's okay. That's okay. But let there be a set day and a set time every week. Where you say, as a family, on this day, all other programs stop. Phone calls, we, we switch off. TV, we switch off. Internet, we switch off and everyone comes. Don't tell us, oh, there was a meeting. A, a meeting, stop. Appointment, stop. We all come back home. Don't tell me there was traffic jam. Uh -uh. Plan for the jam. Plan for the jam. Leave the city early. Let's all come back home. And together, let's come as a, a, a priestly family before the Lord. How long? You choose. You can make it one hour. 
You can make it two. You can make it longer. It's up to you. Start where it is meaningful and doable to all of you. And as you begin to touch the sweetness of God's presence, you will increase the time by yourselves. But make, make this commitment. As we pray right now, husband, look at your wife. Wife, look at your husband. Parents, look at the children. Children, look at the parents. This evening, let's make this commitment. Let's cross this line. When we come back tomorrow to start learning the other things, I want us to have crossed this line. I want you to be an insider. God talks to insiders. There are things he doesn't talk to outsiders. He talks to insiders. And I want you to be an insider. So tonight, I invite you to be a people who seek after the Lord. Uh -uh. To be a people who wait upon the Lord. Let me finish with that scripture in the book of Isaiah chapter 40. And I want you to remember it every time that you come together as a family. Remember it because it is going to be true to you. The word of God does not return to God without fulfilling the purpose for which he has sent it. Hallelujah. So the scripture is in the book of Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to read from verse 27. Oh, let me read from verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by the number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and do you speak, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord and my, ju and my just claim is passed over by my God? Don't be there in your home and you think, oh my God, our sorrow, God doesn't know. Our suffering, our challenge, this trial, I'm... God knows it all. Verse 28, it says, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Brother, sister, husband, wife, grandfather, grandmother, great-grandfather, great-grandmother, children and grandchildren, listen to this word. Take it and make a purpose, make, make a commitment today. We are going to wait upon the Lord. As a family, you can do the daily alone, but as a family, at least once a week, come back together. Come together and wait upon the Lord. Verse 31, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Parent, don't be like Lot. He taught very well, but he didn't take the, the, the children to God. Because when the people are in trial, words lose meaning. And the Spirit of God gains credence. Introduce your children to the presence of God. Introduce your children to the Holy Spirit. When everything else fails and their memories fail, the Holy Spirit will be there. You see, this young boy, Isaac, who knew the altar, later on we see him in life. When the economies had collapsed, famine was all over and he was going down to Egypt as a beggar to try and survive. But because of his relationship with God, he heard the voice of the Lord. And the Lord said, do not go down to Egypt, Isaac. I am going to take care of you in this land of Canaan and I will prosper you in the middle of famine. The Lord told him, so I will make you have a harvest. When you are the, with God, he can make a way where there is no way. For the people who know their God shall be strong. They shall work exploits. 
We want to know God. And I want you to know God. I want your children to know God. I want your grandchildren to know God. We want to be a people who know their God. So that when the end comes to the end, God's beginning starts. And this has been true all through the ages. It shall be true again. Pray, praise the Lord. We are going to pray. And again, I'll ask, I'll, I'll ask us to end this session with that song of worship which says we will stand. And I just want us to be of good resolve and of good faith. We will stand before the Lord. Hallelujah. So, brother and sister, let us come before the Lord. Amen. Loving Father, loving God Almighty, there are times, oh God, when we marvel at your power and majesty and sometimes we are struck with the terrible power you can release but then there are those moments when we are so melted with your love and how compassionate you can be my God that you can bring oh God that sweetness of your presence to surround us I want to ask you, my Lord, not because we are worthy, not because even we know what to do and how to do it, but because you so love us and you want to bring your revelation to us, you want to come around us. Please, even tonight, let your spirit move. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray for the spirit to move in every home where there is a hungry heart. In every home where there is a yearning spirit. Oh God, let there be an impartation today of a deep spiritual hunger that the people will reach out and will reach out seeking after your presence. Oh God, you said seek and you will find for whoever seeks shall find i ask you to give us hearts that seek you hearts that yearn for you hearts that hunger for you oh god even those who have been in slumber with hardened hearts that like rocks tonight in the name of jesus my lord my savior let there be an impartation the spirit of fire melting you people's hearts melting our resolve melting our stubbornness melting our obstinacy and all this worldly wisdom that this world the wisdom we have i call you holy spirit come now come lord come now into every house into every home into every room where your people are waiting upon you Remember your word says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I ask you to release this renewed strength upon your people. Let them testify in the name of Jesus that yes, the Lord touched me. The Lord touched me last night. And Lord, I pray that as you touch your people, they will respond the right way. They will draw near. They will humble themselves. They'll come down, Lord God Almighty. Oh Lord, these are the days you said you will raise up a people such as has never been before and such as will never be again. A mighty army to carry your name. Oh God, I give you praise. I give you glory. Yes, we already feel the move of your spirit here. We already feel the warmth of your presence. And Lord, I just want to pray now. Let it move out into the, into the land, all over Uganda, in the nations, all over Africa, in America, in South America, in Asia, in Australia, in the Pacifics, in, in Europe, my Father, in the Middle East, and in Israel. As many as your people are waiting upon you, let this presence of God begin to touch them, my God. Oh Lord, come now, come now, come now. Let the fire begin to burn. Let the fire begin to burn. Let the spirit begin to melt our hearts, oh Lord. I pray for the spirit of praise and worship to come upon your people because God abides in the praises of his people. Let the anointing of your presence Lord, let your people begin to experience your visitation. Let it begin to touch them, oh God. And let it grow, let it grow, let it grow in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray for your pastors and your leaders, your ministers, your preachers of the word. Lord, as many as have lost this fire, has lost this communion, have lost this 
a com coming together and fellowshipping. Lord, I pray, oh God, that you remember mercy. Remember mercy at such a time as this. Visit your servants, my Lord. Touch them, my God Almighty. And let there be brokenness, King of glory. Let there be a sweetness of communion and a reunion, my Father. Oh God, revive us again revive us again revive us again even as you touch the families my father I ask you to heal the marriages that need healing Lord where the enemy has thrown us apart or oh, drawn us in tensions my father Lord I pray that as the spirit of the Lord comes there shall be that bonding bonding together my Lord and Father, I pray for the young men and young women who are preparing to enter into marriage. Do not let them bump into it accidentally. Do not let them go like that, oh Father. Do not let them just go with blindfold. Father, let them be prepared, almighty oh God, that they shall go and, pr and produce families like Abraham produced with children that know the presence of the Lord, with the children that stand at the altar of the Lord. Father, I pray for families and parents, oh God, who have raised up their children without a communion with, before the Lord, without encountering God together. Forgive us, Master. Forgive us, Lord. Do not let us continue in this way, my Father. Do not let this continue, my Lord God Almighty. But let there be a restoration. Let there be a renewal. Let there be a new beginning, a new start, Almighty God. Break our pride. Break our pride. Break our pride and bring us together in a spirit of brokenness my lord my god in a spirit of humility my lord my god teach us new ways my father teach us new ways oh god almighty give us the humility to receive in the name of jesus father i pray for those in the political scene the people in government and those who are in opposition the mighty wealthy men billionaires and millionaires who think they need nothing who think they have it all and yet they do not have the as poor as the pauper my father because in the spirit they have nothing of value lord i bring them before you in the name of jesus in your mercy my god in judgment remember mercy and in your mercy have compassion reveal yourself to these your servants oh my god that they shall become witnesses to speak their voices have become big voices when they speak many people listen so i pray for them to have an encounter with you my lord my god because when they rise up to testify their voices will carry weight and many thousands will turn to you because of their testimonies I pray for those who are called celebrities in this world, who have gained fame, who have gained a lot of following simply because of the pleasures of this world. And I say, Lord, all gifts and talents come from you. You gave them those talents that they have used to become celebrities. And most of them think they can blaspheme you. They can speak against you. They can treat you like you don't matter. And they can go for the abominations of this world. And they can make Lucifer their God. Oh God, in your mercy, have mercy upon them have compassion upon them do not pay anyone according to what they deserve but reveal yourself oh god reveal yourself king of glory that as we see you we shall bow down in your presence let those great names of celebrities come back with a testimony my father come back and say i have seen the lord i have encountered the lord because there are many who believe in them many will turn to you king of glory many will believe because of their testimony <coughs> and now father each one of us is hungry for you each one of us is hungry for an encounter even those who have encountered you over and over still want to encounter you much more even those who encountered your presence this morning they still want to encounter you yet one more time so i say come lord come lord come come my lord abide with us abide in the praises of your people abide with us oh god let us be soaked in your presence my father my god oh precious lord we worship you 
We praise you, Lord. We give you glory and honor. Lord, we magnify you. There is no God like you. There is no one we can ever compare to you. You are the fountain of living waters. The streams of life that's, that flow in the wilderness, my Father. Where the animals gather and the birds gather, Lord, to drink and dream and drink of life, O oh God. You alone, O oh God, are the soothing winds that blow upon our hearts, my Father. You are the well of eternity, my God Almighty. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. And I give you praise. I give you glory and honor, my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you. I know that many, many people out there where you are, you can already feel this sweet, sweet presence of the Lord. You can feel this warmth. So I say, don't break your prayers if you feel the flow is still on. Don't stop. Just keep going. Continue. Worship the Lord. Pour out your heart. Pour out your heart. And the Lord will do it and will bring it to pass. And even as we worship and bring this song to you, I want you to just flow along with it. Flow along with it. And the Lord bless you. And the Lord anoint you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Oh. 